You know what we haven't talked about in a while? Manga entertainment. Sure, we've dabbled here and there, talking about some of its flagship properties, but for a cornerstone of anime in America, manga has curiously been absent from our watchful eye, and that's mainly because its existence is in limbo. Unlike ADV or Central Park Media, manga entertainment still exists as a legal entity unto itself, but only by the barest of definitions. They no longer license new properties anymore. Rather, as an arm of Stars Media, they sublicense their existing properties through established channels like Funimation or Sentai Filmworks. Their UK division exists as a more tangible entity, but likewise, they share a similar static existence. Which is about the kindest fate you can reasonably expect for one of the first American distributors of anime, considering all the rest went down in flames. It's even more surprising when you find out that the history of manga entertainment is one of confusing buyouts, unnecessary demographic appeasement, and a beginning that couldn't be further from where they are now. Starting off as a music video distributor for the British record label Island Records, the company, through a series of deals that remain murky to this day, got the rights to Akira, which was a veritable money press back in 1991. So, sensing where the wind was shifting, then-president Chris Blackwell transformed the company to the now-recognizable manga video, and bought up licensing rights left and right, and used its record company ties to broaden their shelf space in the marketplace. They also co-produced the landmark Ghost in the Shell, hoping for a repeat financial success with Akira, which, sadly, it couldn't match. Among these many anime that were bought up without much thought or insight are titles that we've already covered here on the show. And don't worry, all I did was carry you here. I haven't interfered with you or molested you or anything. You've underestimated the power of Japanese technology, you evil bitch. Right! Needless to say, manga video didn't exactly focus on quality so much as they focused on name brand recognition, which certainly explains Appleseed. A 1988 OVA that was adapted from a manga by Shiro Masamune, you might have heard about its other, more recent reimaginings, the 2004 CGI film and 2007 sequel, as well as its 2014 reboot. With Masamune's name attached, the thinking was that the OVA was going to be another feather in manga entertainment's cap to go with Ghost in the Shell. But what manga failed to realize was that they weren't getting Ghost in the Shell Masamune, which I'd argue is more of Mamoru Oshii's doing than Masamune, they were getting Tank Police Masamune. Which, if you recall, is a half-blessing. The first half of Tank Police will always remain a classic of 80s anime with all the cheesy datedness and camp fun that it infers. The second half of Tank Police, however, will always remain a bloated, ill-advised trip down Pretension Boulevard with a driver who has no idea where in the hell he's going. So the question is, is Appleseed more first half Tank Police or more second half? Well, only one way to find out. We start off with an expository text crawl, which is weirdly rare for us here on the show, stating that this is after World War III, and a new city has been built to be the utopia rising from the world's ashes, dubbed Olympus. But some within the city have become unruly, and desire ultimate freedom over the comfort of a gilded cage. Heh, <laughs> sounds like the plot of any given 70s prog rock concept album. And it gets better! Among the denizens of Olympus are what's known as biodroids, who are, in no uncertain terms, just cyborgs. One such biodroid is one of our <laughs> Okay. This is Briareos Hecatonkeres. That's right, Briareos Hecatonkeres. For those of you who fancy yourself a Greek mythology buff, you might remember that Briareos was one of the original children of Gaia and Uranus, the three Hecatonkeres, or the Hundred-Handed Ones. One of the stories surrounding the Hecatonkeri states that Uranus was so disgusted with his three hundred-handed children that he actually tried to stuff them back into Gaia's snatch. Mythology is fucked up, folks, but steering this back to the point at hand, forgiving the silly rabbit ears, did they actually have to put him in a set of clothes? I mean, what's the point? If he looks like the AV-98 Ingram, having him wear clothes isn't going to make him blend in, it's just going to make him stand out even more. Like, does he feel cold or, God forbid, shame? Does he have a robo-dick underneath those pants? Well, considering his partner Dune in here is his lover in the comics- Oh god, I'm spending way too much time on this! Bottom line, we got a giant cyborg named after a Greek mythological monster, and in a move so hipster it rides a velocipede to animal collective concerts, a monster you probably haven't heard of. And this cyborg is tasked with protecting a utopian city named Olympus. I might be jumping the gun a bit here, but uh, my question about whether or not this is more like Part 1 or Part 2 Dominion Tank Police... Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and say Part 2. 
We join our heroes in the midst of a hostage situation, and one of the terrorists seems to be getting cold feet. You see, down here they got heavy armor, so avoid that route if you can. Now here they've only got troopers and landmate suits, so this is the way to go now. Uh, hey, where are you going? The bathroom. That ah, stupid asshole thinks he fucking knows a lot. Gratuitous, unnecessary cursing? Yeah, this is a manga script. The thing was that manga grew privy to the fact that their titles were mostly bought by adolescent boys, so they figured to play up the swearing to cater to their audience. Hence why we got lines like this. Don't look so surprised, I'm your fucking backup. All his friends would know his dad was so low he could parachute out of a snake's asshole. Let me out of this cocksucking thing! But anyway, now that Spider Jerusalem here got himself purposefully captured and the rest of the strike team are in place, the SWATs start their raid. By gassing the terrorists and the hostages, and then bullet hosing the room. Who came up with this tactical procedure, Martin Riggs? Damn, you're lucky you got caught. If you were still up there, you'd be toast. <laughs> Why do I get the feeling that this guy's only about two weeks away from retirement? Evans! Evans! Huh? Grenade! Hit the deck! Booby trap! Nothing gets by you, Dunin. So long as you get a five second margin of error. Spider makes a break for it and manages to escape, and Dunin has some choice words for him. He's old bastard! Uh, come again? He's old bastard! Meh, Dr. Cox said it better. Bastards. Bastard coated bastards with bastard filling. Aside from his percentage of bastardom, not much is known about Spider, so Bria Reyes decides to ask someone who sounds suspiciously familiar. He goes by the name of A.J. Sebastian. He's a kind of career terrorist, a real hard case with a string of convictions. It says here he even got caught in an attempt to bust into Gaia. That's how he lost his eye and his ear. All right, I know that this guy sounds exactly like JonTron, but let's be clear. That cannot be JonTron. Just like this cannot be Nicolas Cage, and this cannot be Keanu Reeves. Because then, that would mean time travel is real and in the hands of Hollywood actors and YouTube personalities, and that <laughs> is just absurd. You know, being a part of this futuristic SWAT team must certainly have its perks. I mean, look, they get four A's on their keyboards. Jelly much? Where are you gonna transfer to? I'm going to investigation. Huh? You can't be serious. What for? Because I want to find that son of a bitch and kill him. Sweetie, you're in the wrong anime if that's your goal. Tell me why you're killing these terrorists! You kill them too, don't you? Yes, but it's my job to kill them! But it seems Dunin might get her chance after all when the higher-ups have her and Bria Reyes pegged as possible candidates for bringing Spider down. And speaking of down, lady, put down the teaser and hairspray. You could lose a Geo in that mess. Ah, the 80s. The only time in history when anime hairstyles and real-life hairstyles were equally ridiculous. But tonight they're young, and so they set the world on fire in a coffee house, and drink the night away with Hitomi, the woman who has made it her life mission to rescue as many of the remaining people outside Olympus, still struggling to survive after the war. Place your bets, folks! How long until she's worm meat? Over under says 20 minutes, but I'm gonna hedge and save 30. But the drunken revelry will have to wait as Spider strikes again, this time targeting Tartarus <sighs> with the help of an inside man. Eddie the Meowth guy from Mad Bull 34. Why is he helping Spider destroy Olympus? Because his wife killed herself because she couldn't not live in a blasted hellscape wasteland. Yup, she throws herself out the window lamenting having to live in a gilded cage. As opposed to the burnt out fuck to death pile of steaming caca that is anywhere not Olympus. And because of this, Olympus must fall! Everything's provided for. There's no unemployment, there's proper health care, housing, you name it, we've got it. But that's the problem. We no longer live, we just exist. Living means fighting, struggling for advancement. It's a fundamental part of the human condition. You deny it, you deny life itself. Ho ho ho! Such a rich platter of bullshit. And all at once, too. You spoil me, Appleseed. 
First of all, if you're trying to keep a low profile as you work with a dangerous terrorist to destroy Utopia, maybe don't go on a tear about how much Utopia sucks in front of your police compatriots. Then again, these two are rock stupid enough to hear you plainly explain your motive for wanting to destroy Olympus, and they don't even bat an eye. Fine, Detective, you'll make Dunin. Secondly, even if you do believe everyone walking around just living an idyllic lifestyle without hardship or suffering is hollow and pointless, what makes their definition of happiness less worthy than your own? Especially since they literally go out into the wastelands and find survivors to rehabilitate them into Olympus. Again, literal paradise where healthcare, jobs, and resources are aplenty, burnt out, fucked to death pile of steaming caca. Which would you rather live in? And finally, struggling means living? Is that your meaning of life? Here's the thing, asshole. Yes, life is about struggling, but why do we struggle? To achieve. We achieve by struggling. And you know what we're all trying to achieve? UTOPIA, YOU FUCKWIT! Yeah, they've done it already, Nimrod! The people have struggled, pulled themselves out of the mire of World War III, and have accomplished what we've always set out to do. By building Olympus! Now, they get to decide for themselves what they want to achieve on their own, individually. By your definition, life begins and ends with struggling with no aspirations or goals. Just struggling to struggle. Like a guy who's stuck in a data entry job just content with punching numbers into a system that doesn't know about him, nor cares to. Actually, if we're continuing the theme of Greek mythology, that's Sisyphus, rolling the boulder up the hill in a vain attempt to accomplish something that will never happen. So excuse me if I find your reasoning for killing a bunch of people to be complete horseshit and call it out, because the anime certainly doesn't. Oh, and before I forget, your wife's name? That's what happened to poor Flea. She had everything, but in reality she had nothing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be Freya, but spell checking in the 80s wasn't exactly a top priority. Right, Bully Eros? Stay in here. Bully Eros! Speaking of, the two are finally summoned to meet Hairspray, who imparts their new assignment to them. You will find this terrorist, Sebastian, and then I want you to kill him. I want you to understand that this man's not to be arrested. But ma'am, that contravenes Section 38 of the Olympian Freedom Charter. Uh, Bria Reos, where was this attitude of yours when Dunin literally said this? Because I want to find that son of a bitch and kill him. What was the point of this scene anyway? They were already after Spider, so now they have even more motivation to go after him? Also, why does Brio Reos need to eat? How does he even eat? You know, at least when Dracula was wolfing down a Big Mac, he was supposed to be human, so that I get, but Brio Reos, a full-on cyborg, having a digestive system? You do realize this means he has a robo-pooper, right? Every once in a while, he hops a squad and shits out a few robo-turns. You now have to live knowing that. The two continue into a cheesy 80s montage, trying to find any leads as to the whereabouts of Spider, but it looks like a tip will come to them in the form of a... Gus canister. Why in the world did they think that knockout gas would affect a cyborg that doesn't need to breathe? I don't know. Nor do I know why Dune in here thought ahead to wear a gas mask, too. But it was a good thing she did, because a suited-up Eddie is about to abduct Hitomi. That's far enough. Do what I say and this won't go off. Now drop the gun. Oh my, my, my. Isn't this embarrassing? Far be it for me to tell you how to act, good sir, but, uh, McGruff the crime dog or Lieutenant Columbo? One or the other. Oh, just one more thing. All right, hotshot. Drop the girl or I'll fill you so full of holes you'll be winning the next Mr. Swiss cheese contest. Your euphemisms could use a little work. But the SWAT fucked the situation up and let Eddie get away with Hitomi. Meanwhile, Spider has been killing his way into some underground bunker where Olympus has been hiding their own Metal Gear. Listen, Buster, you're wasting your time. Guy at a central computer will abort your commands. Well, thank you. And speaking of abortions... <laughs> you know, by the 127th trimester, I don't think it's an abortion anymore. But what does Hitomi have to do with Shagohod here? Well, seems that the computer that controls Olympus, Gaia, has an override written into Hitomi's DNA. Why? Because fuck logic and fuck you for asking. So while the wagons begin circling around the one spot Eddie has to go to fuck over Gaia, we finally get the non-bullshit reason why he wants to torch Olympus. Seems a group of faceless psychologists approached him after his wife committed suicide and needlessly abducted him to probe his mind for answers. Not sure why he didn't go after these particular fuckers and decided to screw over countless others, but at least this is better than the life is about struggling dick shit. But how is he going to convince Hitomi to go with him and kill thousands of innocent people? 
Stay away from me. Remember, I'm a biodroid and we can't do anything that could possibly harm our beautiful environment. Hitomi, I'm not asking you as a biodroid. I'm asking you as a human being. As a human being? Well, in that case, let's burn this shit to the ground. We don't need no education. Yep, that is literally all it took to get Hitomi to come along and cooperate with Eddie to fuck over Olympus. Cut to her stumbling into the terminal and dooming everyone. She, perhaps as much as Eddie and even Spider, is directly responsible for all this. Look, I know they didn't intend to make Hitomi a villain, but how else can you look at it? She cooperated with Eddie to get there in the first place, and went into the terminal of her own accord knowing full well what would happen. So the anime had to contort itself into a narrative pretzel just to make Hitomi a culpable accessory to terrorism? Fuck this with Brio Reyes' robo-dick dialed up to overstuffed tumble dryer. Oh, you just know his dick has got to have settings. In fact, let's jailbreak that sucker and crick it all the way up to paint shaker! But all hope is not lost, as even though Spider is taking his new toy out for a spin, Dionin, Bria Reos, and Hairspray are making their way into Gaia's computer banks to hard reboot the entire system. But wouldn't you know it, the security system has been activated and now everyone's a target. Our best chance is to keep moving. It makes us a harder target for the security systems. It's a piece of piss so far! But if this is justice, then I'm a banana! Never change, manga. So, how do you hard reboot a genetically locked supercomputer anyway? By shooting a very specific, very tiny circuit from quite a long distance away using a pistol. Oh, and you have to left hand it too. Because drama. Now you're too far down left. Just keep calm. Right at it. Okay, I know she's just using her shoulder to steady her aim, but you do realize that she's firing a very loud gun right next to Hairspray's ear. Do you need me to play the clip? What the hell, Lana? An archer clip for any occasion. That's the enemy abandoned promise. But yes, she does manage to hit the circuit, on her last bullet no less, just in case there wasn't enough Angel Cop parallels, that ending still pisses me off by the way, and Spider's Shagohod is stopped cold. He also goes down in one hit, too. Like a bitch. And that was Appleseed. Yeah, I was right on the money. This is Tank Police Part 2. Well, it's not as bad as Tank Police Part 2. Whereas Part 2 was listless and dreary, Appleseed was just dumb and amateurish. It barely understood its own ideas and themes of freedom versus security, let alone seamlessly integrate them into its story, and the plot relies too heavily on both characters being conveniently stupid and contrived situations. That being said, it's still way more watchable than Part 2 simply because of its schlock charm, due to its laughably salty script and dub, as well as its unmistakably 80s anime aesthetic. It's not a good bad anime by any stretch of the term, but it's still an enjoyable show for anyone who's nostalgic for 80s anime. And speaking of nostalgia, I think it's about high time we look at an anime that'll be nostalgic for anyone who grew up playing 90s JRPGs. Till next time. <laughs>